Fein, including the Social Democrats and people for profit, all don't seem to be doing too well. Whereas you see parties like Ain2 climbing up the ladder slightly and Independent Ireland and other parties as well, including all the independents around the country. But let's look at what, uh, what Simon Harris said at the Ardesh over the weekend in Galway. He's kind of addressing the stuff that people have been talking about for the last five years. In particular, we'll come to immigration in a second. But he said they're going to build 250,000 houses over the next five years. He might as well say a million houses, say 250,000. I don't believe that's achievable. He said he's going to support business. He says Fine Gael will back your business. And he said we're rolling out a quarter of a billion euro to help 143,000 small businesses across the country. I mean, why didn't they do that last year? When people and businesses were crying out for money and when they were closing down, when businesses currently can't afford to pay back the VAT they owe since COVID. Why aren't they doing it now? Why do they have to wait till Simon Harris becomes the Taoiseach? Of course, farming, he said, under my leadership, I will look at a practical support to help the farming community. Agriculture is a vital part of our economy. They weren't saying that three months ago when they were asking them to cull all their cattle. Climate change. Finnegan wants to support you to make your change your home and your farm business. He says, by the way, by not lecturing, not imposing, and a pragmatic and meaningful climate action. But that's not what the Green Party are doing. They're putting the stick before the carrot. So this is all, I don't know, just talk or spin. I don't know what it is. Unless they're actually going to do all these things. They said they're going to help families. There are many families watching, he said today, struggling with the cost of living. You don't say, Simon. We've helped, though, through a range of measures like tax, college fees, school books, public transport, costs, energy credits, and free GP care by increasing the GP care. All thanks to Pascal Donoghue, and they all gave a big round of applause to Pascal Donoghue. And in fairness, I like Pascal. He's not doing a bad job. He said, anyone who needs a job has one. Incomes are on the rise. Record levels of investment. We have established a fund to protect future generations. People are not seeing that in their pockets, Simon, so I don't know what you're planning to do to fix all of that before the next general election. He goes on about education. He said he reduced the cost of education. That it not, won't impact delivery services. We will improve access to childcare facilities. We'll build more schools. When? How long will that take? You're not going to build up for the next term of office in five years, all these schools. And then finally he came to the clincher. I thought he was going to avoid it completely, by the way, because there was no mention of it for the whole Ardesh by anybody. But he tackled immigration. He said this will be a firmer system. Now, of course, he's talking about the EU Migration Pact, which he's essentially saying we should sign up to. And you might have seen an article in the Business Post today suggesting if we sign up to the EU Migration Pact, we can build these centres at Dublin Airport to process people really quickly and get them out of the country if they shouldn't be here. But hey, we should be doing that anyway, shouldn't we? But anyway... He believes the plan will be better. He also says it will ensure that those who are not entitled to come to this country get the decision quickly and leave quickly as well. He said, we need to listen to the people. But Simon, are these not the same people that you called right wing only going back a short time ago? This is all a bit barmy. Anyway, do you believe him? Do you believe Fine Gael? Do you believe Fianna Fáil? Do you believe Sinn Féin? They're doing a lot of U-turns lately. Will you be voting for them? Or like many people, are you going to vote for the smaller independent parties? Or some of the smaller independent candidates around the country, which a lot of people seem to be doing. I want to know what you're doing. Two questions. Who will you be voting for? And do you trust the government? Because clearly there are some people who still trust them. Let me go to some of our callers today, if I possibly can. Let me go to Carl Dieter. Uh, Carl joins us. And Carl is a financial expert and social commentator. Carl, do you trust them? Well, I think he kind of promised someone th something for everybody without the requisite time required to do any of it. So I wouldn't really listen to any of it with any great level of uh, of interest because it is effectively political hot air. Uh, these are things, by and large, by the way, you could have been helping business long ago. Fine Gael didn't. You could have been looking at immigration long ago. Fine Gael didn't. You could have been looking at parents and families and supports. Again, Fine Gael didn't. Their view is flip-flopped on things like climate change. It's flip-flopped with farmers. Like farmers are the things that keep us, they're the, sorry, things, they're the people that keep us fed. Mm -hmm. Like in my view, after mothers in the country, farmers rank somewhere in like the second or third most important people that we have. Putting the food Without on the them, table, literally, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, I think, I think what happened, there's a few things that happened. I think, you know, Varadka realized that he had failed as a, a leader or had reached his natural term when they went for this referendum that was, full of baloney and got absolutely slapped in the worst possible way. And so now they're putting up the new young buck and he's going to promise the sun, moon and stars in a hope to uh, encourage people to vote for them again. But the, but, what's their slogan know, now? Lots of energy, isn't it? Or this energy, yeah. this word energy they're using. 
Yeah, whatever. It, it, it really boils down to a please vote for us. Like th- that, and that, that's I think is is part of the problem. Is the, is the kind of jingoisms and the electioneering and this kind of stuff. It, it really, I don't know. Like there was a time I remember when Enda Kenny first uh, first came to to power as after Fianna Fáil had cracked the country open, and there was actually a sense that like he wanted to change. Now they also had the IMF in there forcing change. And so course, yeah. like a lot of that stuff was really being pushed through in a way that wouldn't be done under normal circumstances. But look at the TDs themselves. You know, they've given themselves countless raises during their own tenure. They've moved the the wages of, you know, minister from sta- of states up by about 50 grand a year. They've made sure that they're very well taken care of. They haven't done anything to cut costs, to reduce the public sector to, you know, push back on trade unions when they make unreasonable demands. So it's really... They've, well, it they've, they've decimated the, the country business. over the last five years. I mean, don't get me wrong. I thought Leo Varadkar looked like a promising hope for the future at one point back in 2015 and 16. But, but he turned out to be a really bad leader. Nice guy. I think he had the right intentions, but a really bad leader. <laughs> um, you know, and, and Michal Martin, the same. I thought, give him a shot at being the leader of Fianna Fáil and the, and the Taoiseach at some point, you know, because I thought the guy's been trying to do this for years and he has, you know, they had a lot of bright ideas. But in saying he turned out to be a really bad leader. They were yes men to the yeah. NGOs for five years. Well, you know, that's the thing. You see, they listen to the, when they say listen to the people, they're listening to the wrong people. They're listening to the people that they pay to give them the people's view. And that's really not a good setup at all. In fact, I'm reminded, I can't remember who it is that said it, but there was someone who said that they'd rather be governed by the first 200 people in the phone book rather than a group of, you know, uh, Ivy League technocrats. And the point about that is, is we've gotten to a point where we're, 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 we have all of these NGOs and charitable groups and groups funded by the government saying, oh, these are the things that are important. This is what we have to do. And then the government say, this is what the people want. Why? Because the people that we pay to tell us what you want said so. And it creates a massive level of disconnect from reality. And I think that's what people are feeling now. They're feeling that disconnect. But surely they can see people are not stupid. When you look at, say, Sinn Féin doing their U-turns, forget about Sinn Féin at the moment, the the opposition, but even the government parties. I mean, he turns around and he says about immigration, just to let me remind you again what he said in relation to his uh, there will be a firmer system. It will ensure that those who need our help will get it, but it will also ensure that those who are not entitled to come to our country get a decision quickly and leave quickly. Uh, we need to move away well, from well, the well, emergency well, use of hotels and housing as- for housing asylum seekers. We need to listen to the people. This is what the people were saying six months ago, but they were t- called right wing for yeah. saying it. Well, yeah, so look, there's always been this level of slurs put towards anyone who disagrees. I call it the traffic acronym. And it stands for transphobe, racist, authoritarian, far-right, fascist, ignoramus, cretin, or Karen. And that's their standard stock. But he, let's just go through two things. A, is that they don't actually care what you think. They already know what they think. And they've all gone to the same schools, drank from the same fountains. They all think the same things. And when you say that people aren't stupid, unfortunately, when you put enough people together, they actually are stupid because they vote for them again and again. And I have an expression that the masses are asses and it's, it'll be proven because the people who vote for Sinn Féin will just keep voting for Sinn Féin. But let's just look at the actual things that he says. We need a new system that is firm but fair but, and, and whatever other bits. What does that even mean? Like what, actually, what does it mean? What mm. does it, what, none of that, that's just talk. It's not even, and it's even worse than just talk because like, you can discount talk. That's the most dangerous kind of talk. It's like talk where but, but, but what was even more shocking, so, so Helen McEntee said the Business Post over the weekend in relation to the EU Migration Pact, that, you know, once we sign up for that, you know, we can build, a, you know, centres close to Dublin Airport, process people immediately and put those out of the country who shouldn't be here. And I'm going, you don't need to sign up to the EU Migration Pact to do that. You could do that right now if you want to. So why aren't you doing it now? Could. Of, of course you could, but th- this is just more of the same empty talk that, like I said, the, the mo- it's more dangerous. Regular talk can be discounted and laughed at, but talk that sounds like there's some semblance of a plan about it is the th- kind of thing that actually convinces people that you have a plan, and they don't. This could have been done forever ago. Everything that they're talking about could have been done and wasn't, and why wasn't it? What was the big overarching thing that took away all of our national focus? I'll tell you what it was. It was things like thinking about thought crime and hate speech and referendums that nobody wanted, that they got epically slapped down in. So you have to say to yourself, if someone goes out and says, we're the best, vote for us, we know what we're doing, but their actual record is that time and again, 
they go out and demonstrate with complete consistency a level of utter incompetence in understanding what the people of the nation want. If you keep saying yes to that, who's the idiot there? Them or you? Okay, well, well hold on. Please stay with me, Carl, if you can. Uh, I want to go to John, too. John, hi, how are you? How's it going? Uh, John, um, I mean, a lot of people are saying they're going to vote for, you know, either the smaller independent parties, although some of them are getting quite big now. Independent Ireland now have 70 or 80 candidates. Ain't two of a lot of candidates, yeah. 50 or 60 candidates as well. Um, you know, so or some of the independents. But the problem with the independents and the independents around the country, independent politicians, they all have different ideas. So it's kind of hard to bring all that together, isn't it? Well, you see the thing with Michael Collins, you know, and uh, the old who uh, possibly was getting Michael Fitzmaurice, together. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think they're, they're building something here now that could actually work because normally you get a, a group of independents together, they're usually kind of looking for stuff for their own counties and whatever, and they'll kind of back each other up in the door from time to time, then they'll follow with each other. Right, this could be different. But Carl is right there. If we keep voting the, uh, the public, right, if we keep voting with the same people all the same, nothing is going to change. For the simple reason, once they get in, they basically don't care. And well, why, why are the polls? But why are the polls telling us, according to the Sunday Business Post and and you know Red Sea and Amorak polls, which by the way got it drastically wrong during the referendum when they said it was going to be a majority yes yes vote. I believe the poll companies need to be investigated as to how they're getting it so so terribly well, well, wrong. See, but okay, it, but they're it, saying twenty five percent. Leaving that aside, they're saying you know roughly twenty four, twenty three percent, whatever it is, at any given week will vote for the incumbent. Will vote for Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil. I mean, realistically, are they going to vote for them? That many well, people. You see the, the thing is, these polling companies and, and, and these, uh, these, these systems that they have there, Amara and the whole lot, they, if you get on that panel there, they'll ring you once a month and because they know people I know, I was on, on one. I was on one for Amara yeah, yeah. and they used to text me but a load of questions once really every week want, or two. If they really yeah. want to get the pulse of the nation, right, right? You do and you come to my city right here. You go to Limerick, Waterford, Galway, Tipperary, whatever. And you go around and you sporadically knock on doors in different estates. Middle class, upper class, working class, knock and find out what is the satisfaction base with the government. That is your true poll. Not to get on these the, 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 these fancy polls and you uh, you get a texting phone the same people over and over again. Yeah, yeah. over yeah. and over and over again the same people. You don't know what they have. The, what did they ever change their mind on anything? No I mean, I, I, I personally believe, and, and I don't know whether you agree with me, Carl. I think these companies need to be investigated as to how they're doing these polls they because need to be abandoned. They, they well, need well, to they, stopped. But here's the thing: they do make a difference because what happens is if somebody reads in the Business Post or the Independent, or there was a poll said. You you know, Fine Gael have 23% popularity. People look at that and they go, oh, maybe they're not too bad, though, because 23% of the people vote for them. So they are official polls. And if they're not doing them properly, Carl, yeah. and, and I get well, the impression well, they're not. Well, there's, there's two things. A, in defense of pollsters, they can get it wrong. Uh, and B, they can also get it right. We tend to remember when they get it wrong, like everyone's saying that there was no chance, for instance, Donald Trump could win the election in 2016, and then he did. It's like, wow, shock in the polls. Yeah, but no, but look at the poll the on, the, on the recent referendum. But, 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 drastically but wrong. No, I mean, po po yeah. polls are no different than weather reports. I mean, they can get them wrong. Like last weekend, it was an orange warning, you know, all these like storm warnings in the weekend where I lived out in North Dublin was pretty nice, actually. I went for long walks and did all my regular... It was a bit windy. Too. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, but that's that's not something where I'm worried that like, you know, you should stay indoors and, and, and bunker down. But look, the, 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 the thing I would say is when you actually talk about what the people want, the, the, the politicians, they don't listen. If you look at what people actually want, I, I can name about three things that I think most people actually want. They mm -hmm. want a health system that isn't banjaxed where you've got to wait six months to get in or if you go into an emergency room, you're going to be waiting 10 hours. They want uh, no, far less crime. So like anyone who says, I'm going to build a giant prison, I'd probably vote for them on that basis alone. But they want tough on crime. They don't want... Oh yeah, we have a plan to make criminals have a nicer life and maybe you know feed them some some brioche while we talk about their <laughs> their life problems. I want them in jail. So you want a health system? You want you know no no crime or tough on crime? And after that, then something that that basically allows people to to, to do their thing, which is a, a mishmash of a kind of you know transport, enterprise, education, and and if they could just do just those things. I think yeah. mm. this country could be way better than it is, but no one wants to build a giant prison. No one wants to mention the words that scrotes who break people's faces and break into their homes and commit terrible crimes should go to jail. How often do you read about someone, oh, man arrested, some horrific crime, 
with like 50 previous convictions. What, what, what is it about the previous 49 things that he did that nobody seems to understand that person should be in jail and not getting back out anytime soon, but they go into a revolving yeah. process because we have a, a jail system even that, that isn't fit for purpose. Never no, we mind. don't have enough spaces. We've only got 5,000. But sorry, sorry, just John, it says, I mentioned here, John, you believe that Simon Harris will be the shortest living T-shirt in history. <laughs> yeah, I do, I do. Well, you I, you I, don't I, think he lasts long, no? Across the water, I think Sunak is going to lose. They're going to be decimated because they're they're tired as well. They are just tired. They seem tired. They look tired. The public know they're tired. I predict Sunak is going to lose his seat, and I don't think Simon Harris says he'd be the shortest lived ever. I think he will actually lose his seat. I I, I have a funny feeling, but this time next year, Nigel Farage will be the Prime Minister of the UK. I wouldn't be surprised. I'd be well, we'll, rec- we'll reclaim her doing very well at the moment. And I think you know, he'll go you know back what to what, what, what bugs me altogether? This whole idea, all of a sudden, Carl just brought her up there, he mentioned it. This energy. Where was this energy for the last 11 years? Okay, well, hang on, Carl and John. I want to come to Sharon and Carl as well. Sorry, very briefly if I can. Carl, hi, how are you? How are you? Good. Uh, Carl, well, you, you've been listening there to Carl Dieter. You know, um, you, you kind of still ha- are hedging your bets with Sinn Féin. The reason why is, I mean, Sinn Féin won the election by the people, the last general election, okay? Yeah, Sinn Féin, the party for change. The party for change, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it took three parties to come together to stop them from getting into power. A load of shit. You know, these boys, look, Sinn Féin have never been in power. I say, give every political party two years in power. I know you're going to say, oh, that's not long enough. Let let them have a two-year agenda. After the two years, if they haven't fulfilled that agenda, get them out, get the next party in. Walk through them like that. This, this is my, this is the way I but, do it. But, but Carl, Actually, in, rela- in relation to the- Sinn Féin, you've been on the show talking to me about free speech and hate speech laws and all this kind of stuff, right? And, and yeah. yet, Sinn Féin, every single one of them voted for the hate speech laws and not only voted for them, but had an amendment to extend the characteristics to even make them more Orwellian than they actually were. They're the party of U-turns. Yeah, well, that's yeah. what people are saying now. They are the party of U-turns. But look, they still haven't had a chance to show what they can do in power. I mean, the hate speech laws has gone out the window anyway, I think. I think that's, well, if Shane Payne have the way, they'll yeah. be back again. But so, yeah. yeah well, and they, they, they also back to two referendums now. I'll it tell is. you what Sinn Féin need now. What Sinn Féin need now. They need to kick a no in the local elections. And that will wake them up for the general election because otherwise they will coast along. They will win with Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael at the end of the day. You can bank on that. Yeah. Like I, I can't right, actually look. tell the difference. I can't tell the difference between Sinn Féin, for instance, and Fianna Fáil lately. Uh, they, they really, yeah, there like, is no I'm difference. I'm sure there is a yeah. difference. But, 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 but like for instance, take a look at Sinn Féin. They're all against the special criminal court, which is there for putting away serious hardened criminals but then they're all in favour of hate speech, which is there to take regular people yep. and bleed and lay their home and take their phones and throw them in jail for five years, potentially. Like, I don't know. Look, Sinn Féin, I don't even know what Sinn Féin are. I, I know they're a political party at this stage, but what do they stand for that's any different than Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil? Sorry, Carl, I just want to come in there. You're talking about these hate speech laws. Have you seen some of the people who are running in the local elections? I mean, racism is... It's large in this country. It's absolutely Don't mention, shocking. Don't mention any names, Carl. She won't, okay? No, I won't no, mention no, any names. No, no. Okay. I'm not going to mention any names at all. But no. I've put questions to some of these people, and not one of them will give me an answer when I say, yeah, point now, one foreigner doing this, but you have 50 Irish blokes doing it, and you won't come down, and you won't say anything about them. Are you afraid of them? Or what's the story? Why won't you say it? I mean, racism is... Well, hopefully, if there is racist candidates, people and the local electorate will see through that. I'm hoping they will. Yeah, but but is racism no. talking about race, or is it actually hating someone specifically because of their race? Like, I need you to define that because someone said that to me recently. Like, they said that you know it's racist if you say that a Ukrainian person, for instance, coming here and availing of our system, and then saying that they're going to go back home, that you disagree with that. You could be critical of certain policies and how it's affecting a system that has only a certain amount of resources to go around. So describe what you call racism and without naming names, an example of it, will you? I, I, I will actually, yeah, no problem with that. These local wannabe counselors where I live are putting up videos of just black people. No white foreigners, mm-hmm. just black foreigners. 
this lad is wrong. These Africans are wrong. Now, none of them are white. They're all black. Every single one of them they put up is black. Now, if that's not and racism, what's, what's their critique? I don't know what is. Pardon? But, well, I mean, you can put up videos of black people all day, and it can be a wonderful thing. That would be called black music television. Like, like what's on the videos? What's the yeah. bit that makes it racist? Well, I, I assume, well, Carl, what, uh, sorry, what the other Carl is saying is they're pointing out that these people are doing something wrong, but they seem to be targeted specifically people with black skin. In other okay. words, there are, there are other people who are doing things wrong too. Yeah, and as well as that, they put, they put up, they put up, look at all these asylum seekers getting housed forced. Yet they put up of all these people sleeping in tents. I mean, their heads are up their arse. They haven't a clue what half of them are. They haven't a clue what they're talking about. But, but, uh, yeah, but, but here's the thing, Carl. It, would it be fair to say, is the information that they're putting out in the video, is it incorrect? Is it factually incorrect? I mean, because when we look at asylum seekers or people seeking international protection, you, can, you don't want to hide behind the truth that the majority would be, would be people of colour. Yeah, I mean, I have no problem with people of colour at all. You know, and I, I, the, the majority of I, people I they... are genuine asylum seekers. There are a handful I, well, of I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the majority. No, of the majority are aren't, Carl. The majority aren't, uh, Carl. That's actually, that's not really factually true. But secondly, I've actually gone and spoken to groups of asylum seekers in, in the city centre, around the tent city, around the Department of Protection. And I found some of them to be coming from awful places like Democratic Republic of Congo. And obviously, if you're from that country, you know, you're a black African, you're coming here. And, you know, they are genuine cases. I also got spoken to speaking to some people who were absolutely not genuine cases. And they were showing me, you know, pictures of when they were on tour in New Zealand. I'm like, you're not the kind of person. You're coming from a country that's, it's, it's like a proper country. It's not a place that you need to run from. It's a safe country. You just country. want to yeah. live in Europe. And, and the other thing is as well. I, well, I, well, well I, I don't have too much time to go too, too deep into that car, but it would be fair to say the majority of people coming to Ireland claiming asylum are not genuine. They're basic ec economic migrants. Now that oh, doesn't yeah, no, qualify. That doesn't but, qualify them for international protection. So it's but, incorrect but, to say the majority are, you know, are genuine <laughs> asylum seekers because they're not. Yeah, but another thing, Niall, that you need to consider is because Ireland is, on a racial basis, a predominantly white country. It is very. It's not easy to tell when you see a, a crime video if someone's from here, not from here. But I think there's also an acceptance. And I don't believe this is racist, but I think it, it touches on something that is very close to discussing race, is that people usually have an acceptance of the bad apples in their own society that live there, grew up there, and a very different level of acceptance of bad apples that came, you know, that we imported in from somewhere else. And I think that that can sometimes be a very mm. contentious thing. I don't think it gets discussed in a manner that is very constructive, because on one side, you've got people saying, look at these look at these immigrants, look at these refugees, or whoever they are, or whatever their background. They could even be born here, you don't even know, it's just a video. And then on the other side, you have people jumping up and down screaming, racist, racist, fascist. Like it doesn't actually get to the bottom of what the issue is, which is a society where we have too high a tolerance for crime, a fairly unresponsive Garda, and a belief that no matter what crime you do, that you'll be back out of jail very shortly. And that's why I said, I'll vote for whoever will build a giant jail. Uh, Carl, sorry, just in just in relation to Sinn Fein, going back to Sinn Fein. So you but you think give them a shot is essentially what you're saying. Give them a shot. I mean, what harm can it do? We've given every, everyone else a shot. What give about the, what about shot. the newer parties like Independent Ireland or Ain Two or any of the, the, these newer parties, which are running a lot of candidates, by the way. Uh, a fin it was in the Ain, the Ain Two party. I'm not going to mention his name, and he does a, he does a lot of work, but because he's a Dubliner living in the country. He won't get the votes. People have turned around, and he's, he's ran for the local elections the last two times they've had them, and they just will not vote for him because he's a Dublin man living in the country. Okay, but well, do me a favour, stay there, both of you. Let me just go to Sharon as well. Sharon, hi, how are you? Sorry for keeping you so long. I do apologise. Hi, Sharon. now it's okay. If the same, if it's the same person I'm thinking of, Dublin person living in the country, he's got my vote. I think I know who they're talking about, but I think party politics is over, and that means all of them. Um, I think it needs to be independence. I think, that, that, you know, I'd vote for yourself and that first speaker you had on spoke so intelligently and it's people like that that we need to, to mediate for us. Mm. And also, Niall, who, all these apartments that, that are going up while our children can't afford to rent, who are they for and whose taxpayers' money is going to be paying for them? They're coming up everywhere. I'm sure you've seen them. And I'm going, 
Oh, I know my daughter won't afford that. Who is going? Teachers, guards, they won't afford them. Who are they building them for now? I, 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 I don't know who has three of the average person. Car would know this better than me because he works in the financial sector dealing with mortgages all the time. But it's few and far between could afford a house in, you know, Dublin City, for example, or a three bed apartment or two bed apartment, even for that matter. Because realistically, you have to have a substantial wedge and earning to afford to borrow 350 or 400,000. Uh, Carl, can you answer yeah. that? Which Carl? Carl Dieter, sorry. So, sorry, can I tell you that you do need a lot of money? Yeah, like housing is expensive. It's something that's happening, though, all over the world. The cities have gotten hellishly expensive. And that doesn't matter whether it's like Indonesia or China or India or Ireland. It's, uh, who's going it, to live it, it in is. these apartments, Carl? Who do you think is going to live in those apartments? Do you have any, would you have any idea? Because I'm wondering, because I see them, they're on my estate, they're on every friend of mine's estate. Who are they building them for? And whose well, they, money they, they, are they, they going they, they, to use? I'm very suspicious of it, I have to say. Yeah, well, look. Sorry. I mean, just, yeah, sorry, just very briefly, Carl, because I know you have to go there. Go on. Yeah, there, there might not be anything I can say to, to like, allay your fears. Oh, I'm, because I'm not really sure what your fears exactly. are, but, like, who's going to live in them. But so, so that's not a very well-defined thing for me to work with. But what I can say is who will work in them or who will live in them? There'll be a mixture of people who are young working people who will be facing, you know, very high rents because we're also in a situation of very high rents. You'll have young working people who will need a subsidy so that they can afford those rents. You have people who are unemployed. You'll have people who might be, uh, you know, refugee status, might be uh, from certain ethnic minorities who need housing, travellers or anywhere else. And it's going to be a mix the same way that all of society has a big mixture. But if the implication, by the way, is that they're being specifically built for some special group so we can, like, no, the country there's with, no, there's no that, implication. I, I don't think that's the case. There's, okay. there's just... Hi, sorry, oh, there's, well, hang on, Sharon, for a second, Carl, because I know you have to go. Listen, Carl, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, uh, Sharon, just, just getting back to and I understand the point you're making. I don't want to dwell on it too much. And yeah. I do I do appreciate okay. the point you're making. I completely agree with you, by the way. I don't know who we're building houses for or who can afford that kind of money, unless you're in a very well-paid yeah. tech job or something like that. But um, and, and mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, I, I have a plan in my head that could reduce housing, the cost of housing for the average couple and young couple in Ireland. But it's too long-winded to go into right now. But in saying that, okay. in, relation, in relation to who you would vote for currently at the moment... I mean, people are saying, okay, I'll give this independent my vote or that particular independent my vote. But the problem is when you've got hundreds of independents all over the country and they all have a different idea and a different narrative and a different way of running things, that's not really going to work either, is it? No. So what we have is we have, <laughs> I see it as we have two cliffs. We have the, the government on one side of the cliff. We've got the people on the other side of the cliff. We need something in the middle. We need, I don't know how to explain it, Niall. I understand your point about independence, but there mm. needs to be something new put in place. And Now, there are two good independent has, parties. You've got AIM2, as I said, an independent Ireland. Independent Ireland so far now are fielding 70 candidates. So that's really quick. They have built up a huge party very, very quickly and maybe worth a shot. I don't know because they're very different. They're yeah. very new. They've got a lot of ideas. They seem to be listening to people, you know. Yeah, and a lot of them probably, especially the age of the bracket of the 30, 40, no, have been screwed by the government. So perhaps they will have a better perspective. But I, I am looking at the other parties at the moment. I'm looking at also the Irish Freedom Party. I saw some good things and then I saw a couple of extreme things. So yeah. I need to look into it a bit more. Yeah. But I know who I won't be voting for. <laughs> That's Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil or Sinn Féin. No, no, no. Or the them. Greens. What about the Greens? Will they even get a vote? Out? No, Jesus, no. Hey, by the way, Carl, will you give the Greens a vote? The other Carl. I have a sign. I have a sign in my garden. No Green Party members or canvassers at the cross my uh, front gate. No, I have to say, <laughs> I, I, I encourage people. I don't care what they think, but I encourage people not to vote for the Green Party. They've decimated this country. They're, when I say they've they decimated have. it, all they've done is increase taxes, cost people money. Um, really, you know, on the, basically off the back of a hypothesis. So they need to stop, and we need to we need to just get them out of power. I, they're they're dangerous in power, if you ask me. You know, I agree, totally, hundred percent. No. Yeah, let me go to Ibrahim yeah. as well. Ibrahim, hi. 
Hey, Niall, how's it going? Good, Ibrahim. People are confused. They, they don't know who to vote for. They don't know who to trust. They don't know who to believe. You've got the government with their Ardesh over the weekend. Well, Fianna Gael with their Ardesh over the weekend, making lots of promises, saying they're going to start listening to the people once and for all. Do you believe them? Never. <laughs> they never will. Uh, it's, uh, they, don't, they no longer represent uh, the Irish or Ireland at all, in fact. Um, yeah, these, um, they have gone now off on different agendas. Uh, we talked before a few days ago on uh, another one of your shows. Uh, they're representing basically a European agenda, which uh, is also another group of psychopaths deciding what they want and what the people want. Well, I think there's so going to be a big shift a, this year, Ibrahim, because there is a shift, yeah. we see it across the world, towards, people say it's towards the right, but it's not, it's actually back to the centre, right? So this exactly, has got a shift exactly, back to the centre. Right. And I think what's really important, and people need to, to really take this very seriously this year, you know, we have EU um, MEPs, uh, we, which we'll be voting for, uh, again, yeah. on the same day of the local elections. Don't just write that off. Because you, if you look, there are the ones that we voted for last time around, we haven't heard hide nor hair of them in five years. And all of a sudden, they come back three months before the election and they start cutting ribbons to open supermarkets, looking good. Uh, and they've been dossing over there, doing nothing, putting their hand up for every woke agenda. And remember, 75% of our laws and directives come from the EU. So it's really important that you pick the right person to represent us in the EU, as every other country it's important too. And I can see a shift in the EU Parliament over the next four or five years. Yeah, and um, I have my person that, picked for that. Have you? Yeah, uh, I, I, I do. I, I'm not sure how the uh, the effects um, yeah. in terms of um, do the EU uh, candidates have to follow basically the agenda of the current um, party who's in charge. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, yeah. So it's it's. And who it's who are you going to vote for? By the way, going. Ibrahim, who are you going to vote for in the, in the EU this year? Now, and they all haven't announced who's running yet, but I think there's a few of them have announced. All right. Um, I've listened. I've listened to, and I kind of liked. I listened to her the other morning, but I have to look into it further. But I liked, uh, you know, how she sounded, Cynthia Niverku. Oh, okay, okay. But I have to look at others first. It's not a complete decision, but she's. I'm looking at her. Okay, and what is it about her that you think that would make you want to vote for? Well, now I'll have to go to my diary, to be honest okay. with you. Okay. No, I, no, that's I'm, I'm just curious. I'm just curious. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Ibrahim. Another day, I'll tell yeah. you. So, Another Ibrahim, day. who would you vote for in a general election tomorrow, Ibrahim? Uh, I'm going probably towards uh, the independent. Uh, I thought about Ayn too, uh, but uh, definitely not one of the main parties, for sure. Mm. There's no way in hell ever again. I don't think uh, I would ever consider. Uh, nobody in their right mind should ever consider the uh, parties who have been running the country for the past 20 years. So, uh, yeah, it's um, uh, no, no, not even. I don't think giving Sinn Fein a chance either, because uh, they kind of they talk the talk, but they're always, you know, doing something else, um, kind of back or always backpedaling on everything. So um, yeah, Carl, yeah, Carl wants to, Carl wants to give them a chance. He said he's going to vote for Sinn Fein. He's going to give them a chance. No, I, 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 them I, a was, chance. I was pro. I was with them in the beginning, uh, you know, but over the past few years, I've just seen that, um, no, it's, uh, mm. they're not trustworthy either. I think they just uh, became similar to uh, yeah. uh, Sinn Féin and Sinn Féin. Uh, see, so. uh, Carl, I'm sorry, Carl, but a lot of people are saying the same thing about Sinn Féin. I know you want to give them a chance. And yes, they might have been the party for change five years ago because people just wanted something different or crying for something different. Now there's other options. You know, they're not really the party. Well, they're the party for changing their minds, probably, but that's the best thing to have a way to describe them. Um, they're not really a party for change anymore. They're, they're the same as the government. They're just a, a, a cheek of the same arse. Well, that's look, uh, everyone's entitled to opinions. But the biggest thing people are afraid of in this country is change. You know, and you're... I don't you're think so. I think people are dying for change. Yes, oh, my God. Well, I, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we all say that, but when it comes down to when it goes to the polls, you will get the older generation, the Fianna Fáil, the Fianna Gael, diehards, the Labour diehards, who will still go out and vote for them parties. You know, and well, if, then we need to be getting out and, and, and talking with those people because if we don't start moving our arses, nothing's going to change. Well, I mean, work, this, this is what I can see. I mean, I'm not going to say Sinn Féin are going to win it. I'm not going to say Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael are going to win it. But if you have to take three parties that, who, who have been at war in factions for years to come together to stop Sinn Féin getting into power, there's a big problem somewhere. And, and that's what they've done. You know, it took three of them to do it the last time. And people will, people will still vote for them, mm. unfortunately.
Look at the Labour Party. That's why there needs to be more discussion and debate with those older people. Get them into a hall, get them talking, get them mixing with each other and, you know, changing these opinions because their children are being impacted by these decisions. Sorry, Ibrahim, you want to say something there? Go ahead. No, I was going to just say that uh, we can see clearly from uh, just Mary Lou herself from uh, when she went and voted and did her, you know, uh, photo op voting for the pro hate speech bill and then, you know, backpedaling after it lost. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, this is, they're just liars. That's, it's politics. You know, we don't want politicians. This is the thing. We need people with experience. Government is a business. You know, people think it's just, you know, bring somebody who knows how to talk smoothly. Yeah. It's not about that. It's, you know, we have to consider how to manage the country first before thinking about external politics. If we withdrew from everything from the external part of the world, the, the politics of the rest of the world, and focused on Ireland, it would be back to one of the richest countries in the world. No, it, when we, then, when what, you're, so then what you're suggesting is we lead the EU. I, I, no, I think we don't need the EU at all. Mm. We need to get out of the EU, to be honest. Out of yeah, the a lot of people believe that. something yeah, that's really believe totally that. damaging for this country. Yeah. The problem with that is to get out of the EU. Who are the biggest benefactors of the country from being in the EU? It's not Ireland. And it's the, far, it's the Farmers Association. And they are a huge group. I mean... I've, I've well, I, I, when you say they, they benefit, they get subsidies for empty fields. But in saying that, you know, they could fill those empty fields. They could happily look at look at the EU we're doing to agriculture at the moment. They're destroying it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. I mean, I mean, Carl, we 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 are. I mean, I've said this before. Ireland have never had an opportunity to run their own country. We were operated by the British for many years. Yeah. Then we were operated by the Catholic Church. Then we had the European Union, of course, or the EEC, as it was called at the time. Then the Troika took over in 2009 when we went to the wall. Then we handed it back to the EU. And then we gave it to Neffet and the WHO for two years during COVID. And now it's back to the EU again. It's practically the EU that are running the country. And so, Carl, we've never, well, really ran our, we've never really ran our own country. We seem incapable and we're of we're about to sign it over back to the WHO with this. Yeah, pandemic treatment and the EU migration poverty. pact, which is you know handing yeah. over our asylum process as and well. A and a lot of the EU are buying up our lands as well and doing God knows what with them. And mm. and then you've got all the American companies and the pension funds. You know these places aren't be, being able to be bought; they're just and, being and built I, to rent. And I do agree with Carl. Land. Based on the good government, the current bunch of gobshites we have running the country, maybe we are incapable of running our own country. But with the right people in charge, Carl, you know, and the right laws and getting rid of, say, for example, stupid fracking bans that we brought in about seven years ago, where we do have oil, which should be investigated off the coast of Ireland, we probably could be one of the richest nations in the world. Well, they say we have something like 300 million barrels of oil off our Billion, I think it's actually billion barrels, yeah. Yeah. Billion, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, why we're not using that to our advantage is beyond me. But you're right, Niall, on what you We said. also have we one of the biggest one. zinc reserves in the world. We have natural gas. We could actually supply most of Europe with oil, gas, zinc, and many other natural products as well. We could be one of the richest countries in the world. But we, do, but we don't have the capability to run it. And we have too many NGOs and lefties out there telling us what we can't and can't do. Can and can't do. But, but which, which party sold them off? They all did. Like, at least the boat. Well, they all well, did. I don't think I, I don't don't think Sinn Fein has. I don't think Aim Two has. Sinn Fein will. Sinn Fein, Sinn, Sinn Fein will sell their soul to the devil. They don't seem to care. Look at the, look at the lying they're doing at the moment, Carl. They roll with the wind. They yeah. roll whichever way. It's all rolling. But well, all, polit- all political parties will do that, Sharon. You know, it's. It, it, well, politics this is what we're saying. Cool. We need we need people who will not. Well, we want the ones who stand firm. There's, there's too yeah, many we, there's too many dynasties still running in politics, especially Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. You know, and yeah. they're, they're carrying this down through the age. And you have to get rid of the dynasties and get young people, new blood exactly. into all these parties. You know, the yeah, are still it's true. To change. They don't want to it's get true. rid of. Oh, well, 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 may, well, maybe we need new parties, completely new parties. You know, I mean, it moved, to move away from Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil, uh, forget about the what Greens, just ignore with, I forget about Labour. With renewal Ireland. And make them more accountable well, as well to the people. Make them more accountable. By the way, Lucinda Creighton, Renewal Ireland, she started off in New Ireland, Lucinda Creighton, who left Fine Gael originally. Uh, she worked with Enda Kenny in, in Fine Gael, and she left because she lost the whip. 
But I have to be honest with you, I thought she was great. And I thought the party ideas were great at the time. It just didn't do well because I don't know what happened on the debate on the night of the general election. She wasn't on her top form, I don't believe, although I do believe she's a really good speaker. And I think she lost it, but she had some wonderful ideas about changing the tax system completely, um, getting rid of tax credits to avoid people avoiding tax and bringing in a 10% tax rate for everybody, which I thought was a very clever idea. I thought there was loads of clever ideas that Renew had. Maybe now would be a good time for her to come back. I don't think so. Let's lobby her to come back. I, I, she, she's actually in a really good job at the moment, making lots of money. I don't think she could be bothered, to be honest. Uh, yeah. uh, anyway, I, I think she has her own business. Let me let me go to Morris. Thank you, Karen. Let me just go to Morris. Morris, hi, how are you? Niall, how are you doing? All right. Good, nice to talk to you, Morris. Morris, uh, over the weekend of the Ardash, of course, Fine Gael are promising the world. You know, Simon Harris now going to be the Taoiseach of the country. Do you have faith in them? No, and uh, as soon as we can get this election over with and done, with, they need to be sent a message from the people of Ireland. They're, they're bringing in a party to run the country. Tisha, listen to me. And he was the reason the last government fell because he was a minister of health and they had no confidence in him. And that's why the election was called because women died on his watch. And they were giving him the reins of the country to run the country. The first thing, Are they mad? For, the first thing he said when he came into office there was, and remember, Ireland is not just for the Irish. That's exactly what he said. There you go. Yeah. I and mean, yeah. like his counterpart said in America, oh, uh, St. Like Patrick warning. was an immigrant male. Uh, St. Patrick was an immigrant male from <laughs> Europe who came to Ireland. <laughs> yeah. What a joke. <laughs> what a joke. That man has no idea of history. And somebody stood up and said, well, you're an Indian from India. What the fuck do you know about Irish history? Nice. Well, I think, I think it's an awful shame St. Patrick wasn't around now to get the rats out of the country, isn't it? Yeah, um, well, do you know what I said to St. Patrick, Niall? Do you know what I say to St. Patrick? You might have got the snakes out of Ireland, but you forgot well, about the snakes. The snakes, sorry, the snakes, snakes. I do apologise. He's taking the, the rats, rats as well. The rats yeah. and the snakes. <laughs> anyway, so, Morris, who will you be voting for? Yeah, Niall, yeah. I'll, I'll be going, I'll make sure... I'll vote for any independent that can go in there and cause havoc because they'll have to do a deal with them. You're talking about a government, right? A three-headed snake that stole power from, Fine, from say, Sinn Féin that should have been in power. The people wanted them in power. What did they do? They turned on, the, on, on them and said, right, you are the arm and the bomb and the balafox. We don't want you in the government. The Greens, Fianna Gaw, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, to me, stole the election for five years. Mm. What did Sinn Féin do rather than come out stronger against them? They joined them and turned up the people and said, oh, you'd better vote for these two referendums. And we gave everybody the two fingers and said, no, the people of Ireland don't want this. So now we'll, one minute they're in opposition to them and then they're siding with them. I right? know it was a very yeah. clever tactic, Sinn Féin done, Niall. You know what Sinn Féin done? They only put their posters up outside Leinster House. They never went outside that area. And I have photographic evidence there. They put them up, oh, yes. They never went into the working class areas. That's a clever ploy. And then when they realised the people turned and said, no, hang on a minute, we don't want this. We don't want the vote. Oh, we, we, we didn't agree with them in the yeah. first place. Well, yeah. That's that they blow I, 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 as I'm saying to you, if you didn't agree, why did you tell people to vote yes? I mean, it's, it's unbelievable that a politician, and, and by the way, there was a few politicians who said they hmm. encouraged people to vote yes, but then voted no themselves. And I couldn't believe they I actually said that. that. Yeah, and I see now there's an ex-employee who just retired our varsity here on Maluli, the Western correspondent. He's going forward now as a uh, for uh, Main Flanagan seat. Yeah, in uh, with Independent Ireland. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, no, right. I... So the more independent and Ireland you can get into the doll, the better. If Malachy Stevens is his running, and I can vote for him, I'll run for him because mm. he has this country where it needs to be in your heart. And if you want what's good for Ireland and every all the people in Ireland, you listen to the likes of Malachy. But those people that are in Leinster House, St. Patrick missed you. These are snakes. You sold your soul to the devil just to grab power. And what are they doing now? They realise the game is up and they're abandoning ship. And who are they giving it to? A man who was voted out of power and who caused an election, Simon Harris. And women of Ireland died on his watch as Minister of Health. I'll never forgive him. Sorry, Ibrahim, you wanted to say something there. Harris. Uh, sorry, no, with regards to Simon Harris, now with regards, no, sorry, talking about the Constitution, I had seen something, I had read something somewhere where when a Taoiseach resigns, um, the whole party is has is to technically resigned, yes. Stuff. So uh, why is there somebody... Okay, there's a, tech, a lot of people have said this, this is a, and put it up on Twitter, and I've seen all that up on Twitter, by the way. There is a technicality around that, and the technicality is um, Leo Varadkar did not resign as Taoiseach. 
he, was said, he, was, he, he resigned as the leader of Fine Gael. So what he yeah. did was they have just changed the Taoiseach. They have voted in a new Taoiseach and they're just changing Taoiseach. He didn't resign as Taoiseach. He resigned as oh, leader yeah. of Fine Gael. So there's a slight technicality. So, I know according to the Constitution, he's, he, it's, he, he's supposed to resign as Taoiseach, but he didn't. Yeah, so he, they, yeah. they played with the constitution. Basically. Oh yeah, so yeah this, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 te- so, so unfortunately for all the people who put that up online, there's a technicality involved. He didn't. Res- he never. If you listen back to his speech that he made two weeks ago when he stood on the steps and said he was resigning, he said he was resigning as the leader of Fine Gael and president of the Fine Gael party. He never said, and he said, but I said I will continue to be Taoiseach until a replacement is chosen. Niall, can I just say something there yeah. about this government? They went. Harris is going around doing the rounds to see who'll put his name forward on the ninth of uh, this month coming uh, to see who'll put him through his t shirt. He's dealing with Michael Lowry. Michael Lowry was the worst excuse for an independent ex FEMA Gale T D that was put out of government because of financial wrongdoings. And he's still in there. That's to tell you how much this government... Well, well, I've said that to you before. The difference between this government and the government 30 years ago, where the government 30 years ago cared if they got caught. Nowadays, they don't care when they get caught because people will just back them up anyway. So, Morris, you've got to go for independence. But the only problem I have with your idea of voting for independence is that, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. with lots and lots of independence being voted for, they all have a different idea of how the country should be run. And you don't get proper cohesion. Everybody wants to be like the... uh, Mafia from Kerry. They get everything for their people down there. The two brothers that are in the doll. What's the name? You have Michael and Michael. Is, Michael and Jackie Healy Ray. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's a dynasty. What a dynasty. And now their children are councillors. So they're making sure that area and that Kerry County gets what it needs. And if everybody can go into the doll, have a party going, and don't be going in for yourself and what you can get over. You're going in for the people of Ireland and all the people that live in Ireland. And if you have that in your heart, you'll get things done. But listen, there's a famous yeah. quote from the America, America, and the, the president said, show me a politician that gets rich from politics and I'll show you a crook. End of story. <laughs> it's a good line to end on. Thank you, Morris. Let me go to Natalie as well. Natalie, yeah. hi, how are you? Hi, yeah, how's things? How are you doing? You've been listening to Ibrahim and Sharon and Morris yeah. and everybody's talking about independence and independent parties. Yeah. What are you going to do? Um. Well, yeah, I mean, I agree with a lot of what they say. I think... My, I suppose, my ideas, my opinions of, of politics, I, I never really paid too much attention until COVID hit. And then it was my antennas went up and I was like an eagle watching everything they said, everything they did, all of the emergency legislation, everything they were telling us to do. And that's when I saw the true colours of what politics was really like for me and how it affected the country and how they took away our rights with absolutely yeah, no still no apology. Still no apology. Still no one has turned around and said, we got it wrong. We apologise. Um, Leo stood up in the jail when he was questioned about all of the excess deaths. Oh, yeah, we're going to investigate that. Still nothing about it. They were to investigate all the nursing homes and then they wouldn't um, produce what their findings were because it wasn't in the public interest, apparently. This is what we were told. Mm. It's so corrupt. They are all so, so corrupt. And then when Sinn Féin were basically, you know, oh, great, brilliant, Sinn Féin is, in, you know, they're going to save us all. And <laughs> <laughs> how, how people's opinions have changed very rapid. They have to be the worst opposition party I've ever come across. They are. I would, I would agree with you. I believe that the worst opposition of in the history of the state, I believe that the worst opposition is, party. And it's, it's embarrassing. It's appalling. It's a shambles. Like how they can you know, just flow with the tide like that and not, but in such a short space of time, it's so obvious. It's not even enough time has passed that people are forgetting. Do you get me? It's really but, obvious. But, 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 hey, but here's the thing. You're saying it's really obvious, and I agree with you, by the way. Look at how Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil have mismanaged this country over the last five years. The numbers it's of horrendous. homeless people have gone up. Immigration is a disaster. Yeah. The health yeah. service is falling apart. The hospital still hasn't been built. Yeah, COVID mm-hmm. was a mess. I mean, look at how disastrous they have been, right? Sinn Féin are useless. We all know that. The Green Party are nothing but people who want to charge us taxes, and they're useless. But yet, there will be national amnesia on the day of the election and people will go in there and they'll look at the pretty face of the girl yeah. or the boy from Fine Gael or Fianna Fáil yeah. and they'll vote for them. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, I've seen it happen already. Like, I would regular, regularly have conversations with our, like, our nursing students that come in and say, gee, do you remember when they made us do this? You know, they made us go in 
to a restaurant and sit down, uh, you know, and then once we were sitting down, we could take our masks off because then we weren't <laughs> going to kill all grannies, <laughs> yeah. you know, but then we had to pay for a meal. Oh, nine euro meal. It had to be nine euro. It had to be a nine euro meal. Absolutely. Because COVID, knew how, COVID right. knew how much you were spending. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and those little, foot, those little footprints on the path, like they saved lives. No, they really did. Well, we, Once you well, stood we, on those little footprints, honest to God. Well, we now, I don't know why there isn't a full inquiry into it, because we now know, and we knew, by the way, in a very short space of time, if we looked at the data, we now know uh, from all the research yeah. been done around the world that lockdowns and masks made absolutely no, no difference. Work. No, They you know, didn't work. And, I, and honest to God, like, I would actually have a conversation with, with doctors about it, and they still are adamant that, oh, no, 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 masks are this, masks are that. I'm like, oh, good luck. Yeah, if, you, if you're in an operating theatre or something like that, masks are a good idea because it's just droplets falling onto empty wounds and that's or open all, wounds. That's it, yeah. Sorry, Ibrahim, what are, you, what are you trying to say there to Natalie Ibrahim? Sorry, I'm say that again. Go ahead, Ibrahim. Uh, uh, yeah, I was just saying, um, with regards, you, you said there's a lot of independence, but uh, there's no clear direction. Uh, I think there needs to be some kind of a unity from them on, uh, in terms of a manifesto with a clear message uh, that shows which direction, what they're aiming for, who they're caring for. And uh, what you know, what but, the, but then you're asking yeah. people to you're asking people to come together. Now there are, there is two aim to an independent Ireland, of course, are fielding candidates across the country. Many of those would have been independents, uh, but they're all running under the guise now of our independent Ireland aim to, and they have a website with clear policies on it, so people could look at that, I suppose. Um, but the rest of the independents, the problem is, Natalie, when you're voting for independence, you're voting for somebody yeah. with an idea. That's fine, but yeah. there's other independents who get a vote, and it just it all gets diluted because they all have different ideas. So it is a bit but of a problem. But that's kind of where I was going. I, I went off on a bit of a ramble there. Sorry, Kelly. <laughs> I went off on a COVID tangent, which I tend to do a lot. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I'm kind of going to go back to that. Like out of all the, there's been a couple of independents over the last, say, four or five years that have really, really stood out in regards to their their strength, their bravery. They stood up, they spoke out, despite all of the, the backlash they got. And one of those was Padre Tobin and the Aintree Party. So... You know, as opposed to, you know, obviously voting for independence is quite difficult from for the reasons that you said. So mm-hmm. if I was to vote for anyone, it would be Ain Too and it would be Padre Tobin. Like, I think, yeah, you well, know... I think Ain Too and Independent Ireland are pretty much the same policies. The two yeah. of them pretty much have the yeah. same policies. Ain Too would be a bit more pro-life, I think, than, than Independent yeah. Ireland. So that would be the difference yeah. between the two. Uh, Independent Ireland are probably a little bit more open about their policy in relation to immigration. A lot of people are mm. having a go at Padder. I know I've spoken to Padder many times. He's a good friend of the show, and I like Padder. But yeah, I, a lot yeah, of people, I've heard him a few times with you. A, a lot of people have said that you know, ain't you are a little bit slow to come out and talk about how they will deal with immigration. I think he's nailed his colours to the mass on that. To be honest, which I think he's quite clear about it. So yeah, yeah, yeah and I would agree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think you know our new uh, T shock. Um, you know, his as, as wonderful as his, his lovely little flowery speech was, it's almost like, okay, I need to tick boxes. I need to say all of these things. It doesn't really tell people what exactly I'm going to do about them, but it's very vague. It's very broad. And it'll just, you know, give people enough kind of crumbs to just keep them happy. But yeah. all of these things that he's addressed, whether it's, you know, housing, um, employment, the healthcare service particularly, um, you know, he wants to keep people in Ireland. He wants, to, you know, for people not to immigrate, basically. But you can't kind of bolster a, a healthcare system with staff and with, you know, guards and nurses and everything like this when nobody wants to stay in Ireland. Everyone's leaving. Because there's nowhere to live. Well, they, well, they, they were That's to, it. Yeah. yeah. But it's not even that they've nowhere to live. It's, it's the, the cost of living here. It's mm. the cost of a house. It's the work-life balance is crazy, particularly for doctors, for GPs, for nurses, for healthcare workers. It's absolutely bonkers. No wonder they go to Australia and stay there. They don't come back. So, you know, the dropout rate for, for nurses is on through the roof for nursing students. You know, I think last year it was over 50% had dropped out by January. That's a, that's a huge amount. Yeah. So, it, you know, like as a nursing student, you expect to work 13-hour shifts for nothing, for no money whatsoever, and then study, and then complete, like, you know, your college work, your assignments, and then have a weekend job as well. It's bananas what they expect from people. So, like, that's just from my perspective, from the healthcare perspective. But across the board, how can people afford or be happy to stay in Ireland? 
I mean, I, I don't know if you're, a, you know, a young guard or a young nurse or whatever. We always talk about the guard and the nurse. It must be the guards and nurses marry each other. I don't know. But if you're a young yeah. guard <laughs> or a young nurse and you're on, you know, starting pay, which is reasonably low, um, you know, that, but yeah. mind you, that's the way it is in most jobs, of course. You know, you go in increments and you go up. But if you're on a starting pay, you know, and you're not getting any, you know, overtime or allowances on top of that or whatever it is, you're not going to be able to afford to live in the city. You just can't. No. So, I, so I don't know where no, you no, go. They expect anywhere. people. To, I don't know where. I suppose house share is the only thing yeah. they can do, isn't it? Uh, well, stay there for a second because I want to go to Neem. Student accommodation as well, yeah. but sure they can't, you know. Uh, sure. where, that, where, they can make all the promises in the world. Giving all the immigrants, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Neem, hi, how are you? How are you? How's things? Good, Neem. Neem, you know, people are losing faith in, I don't think they know who to vote for anymore. They're kind of losing faith in everybody, aren't they? I pretty much can feel their pain as well. Um, the last, I, oh, to be honest, if you'd have said to me 10 years ago, I would vote for Sinn Féin in any election, I would have laughed in your face. The last time we gave them the benefit of the doubt, and what we saw was a ridiculous miscalculation for a start. They didn't put out enough candidates to take the majority. I don't know if that was planned or it was just a genuine mistake. I don't know who makes the mistake. I don't, I don't think they had enough confidence in themselves at the time, yeah. Yeah. But when they got in as opposition, they still rolled and voted. We saw, uh, we all see the things on on yeah, social media, the who votes for what. They just voted for like, and, and recently the biggest backtrack I've ever seen of a political party in the in the history of the state, I think, was because the big double no was was rammed down their neck. All of a sudden, they're trying to distance themselves. You guys voted for this, and the same with the hate bill. Yep. This hate speech thing. But, they, but they, actually, they actually tried to claim on RT television that they didn't vote for it. They actually just lied. Like, you were the lying. They're only fooling themselves at this stage. But, they, but the problem, is, but the problem is, is, Neem, you're on top of it. Natalie's on top of it. But not a lot yeah. of people. You know, they're, they're just people who are apathetic out there who don't really follow politics. And they believe that. Yeah. They believe that Sinn Féin didn't vote oh, for I it. I know. They believe everything they, they see on RTE, which is the worst thing you could possibly do. But... Um, it's the only real problem that we have. Like, I, I 100 percent agree with that girl. The, the Natalie, who's rummaging through her food at the moment, there or whatever she's doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they were, oh, um, hold it, hold on for a second. Who's where's the seagulls coming from? It, it's not at my <laughs> Natalie, I'm, where you are you? I am in work, and I've just given our little pet seagulls. His name is Stephen Segal. And we have. <laughs> he comes. Stephen Seagal. Stephen Seagal. He comes every evening for his bit of bread. So all his pals are here squawking at me. So sorry, that's what I was doing. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> we just we were just curious. Sorry, Neem. I do. I do. Sorry. sorry no, you're on. fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. But I, I, I actually looked at the the whole perspective of where are we with real opposition, real independent. If the independents got together, how come can we form a government? Ain two are probably our best, real best, because they're the most grade up. What What about Independent people. Ireland? They're fielding as many, if not more, candidates. Yeah, well, if if we look, I'd love a government formed of all these other people and just keep the other lot out. Yeah, so Ain two, Independent Ireland. Working. Yeah, keep people yeah. before profit out. You need to keep the sock Dems out. You need to keep them all out. To be honest with you. Yeah, the Greens but, as well. Like I'd love to see, um, like Ain to Pater to Bean has been phenomenally good for standing up for what it is, and he's not afraid to take a slap yeah. from them. Um, and the flag is out there. I, I have to say, my my cousin joined Ain to. He's heavily involved in trying to save the Irish fisheries. He's based down in Cork. Um, He's been out to the uh, EU for numerous amounts of times at this stage, fighting for the rights of yeah. fishermen around the country. Um, he, Patrick Tobin, contacted him and he kind of read his manifest and his plans and he said, he's a very intelligent bloke. Um, and he, he said to me, listen, this, this is probably our best bet, really, for a, a fair society in this country because yeah. the other lot, they, they get in and all they do is line their pockets and they look at the EU jobs and they just oh. do what they're told. Yeah, you know, no, I know I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I know Michael Collins from the Independent Ireland has been talking a lot about fisheries uh, recently too, by the way, as well. They, yeah. I think they said, because of course they are, they started off as a rural party 
uh, Richard Dunne, yeah. Michael Collins, and Michael Fitzmaurice, who's a great speaker, by the way. But the, they they talked yeah. about yeah, rural issues initially, but but now they seem to be onto national issues, and they they're fielding a lot of candidates. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I got to go to Stephen as well, just before we wrap this up. Stephen, hi. How are you? How are you, Neil? How are you, Eva? How good, are you, man? Good. Stephen, who will you be voting for? Uh, let me see. So, uh, are you talking about the, the Europeans or the generals? Yeah, uh, Europeans, uh, locals, and generals, of course, if they're coming before the end of the year. I mean, who are you putting your money on, or is there well, anybody I, worth I, talking I think, about? I think, I think it is different, uh, depending on whichever elect, electoral area. Uh, people really have to narrow down on the individual rather than the party at this point. Um, I, there's a, a very good example you brought up there of Aontu and Independent Ireland. I would say the difference between those two parties is that Independent Ireland have refused to sign up to Einar's uh, election protocol. Um, mm-hmm. They on to have previously signed up to the election mm-hmm. protocol, which shows that they have uh, allied themselves with the Sinn Féin's, the Fianna Falls, the Fianna Gales in the past. Well, so now, to I, be, I, no, I, want, I want to clarify, they haven't signed up to it yet this time. They did the last time, I know that, but they haven't but, signed but, yet. But they did, the, they did the last time, and that led to us suffering for four years while they stayed silent on certain issues because they signed a legal agreement. So that, 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 that to me is not uh, a party that would speak for the people. That is a party that will stay silent on certain issues. I do, I, no, they, no, to be fair, yeah. Stephen, um, you know, hold on. I've had Padder on the show many times over the last year or so. And he's spoken about immigration. Great. I think he's great. Yeah, he spoke about immigration great. many times. He hasn't been silent. Yeah, no, no, he, no he, he's great. I think the man is bang on. But he made the mistake of signing that, uh, signing up to that, which silenced his party on the immigration issue, which led to the establishment calling us all far right and him staying silent. So no, I, I, I don't, say, again, I disagree with you. I don't think he... No, hold on. He hasn't been silent. Padder has been very outspoken in relation to, you know, bad immigration practice over the last couple of years. He's been very outspoken about it. He hasn't been well, silent. To, to, to be fair, I'll, I'll put one more ball back over the next on that one, Niall. The INR election protocol was specifically to not campaign on matters of immigration mm. during the election. And that, that, That's that right, to yeah. me is... Is uh, what well, we'll, I'll be interested to see. Uh, give them the benefit of the doubt, and I'll be interested to see if they sign up this time. And if they do sign up, by the way, I'll bring Padre on to talk about why they signed it. So, anyway, well, but, I, I, I think you should bring him on before and beg him not to because that, okay. that, that will lead to five more years of torture for the Irish people. Uh, okay, we but, need representation on the matter of immigration. Anyone that signs that pledge is against the people. Yeah. Simple as that. Okay. Uh, so, the, so the main matters for you, the main issues for you, will be any party who is willing to discuss immigration in, in a practical manner. Open uh, any any issue openly. Any anyone that has the bravery to to deal with any topic openly, listen to the people and represent the views of the people openly. Their politics could be right wing, could be left wing, but they have to come to the table honestly. And the hidden hand of Europe and the UN must be removed from party politics. I would say. The party whip system is looking dead to me as well. Trust in Fianna Fáil, Sinn Féin. Well, 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 Independent Ireland have already said in their manifesto and their policies that they're not, they don't have the party whip system. So, you know, excellent. Yeah, so candidates are willing, you know, are happy to to listen to candidates' other views. Yeah. This is why I would say Independent Ireland. I will also say there are three parties that do not get a fair shake at the stick, which would be the National Party, Freedom Party, and Ireland First. Uh, it's important to remember that, uh, that they are out there. They are the three parties that have uh, campaigned on the streets the hardest and have stood with the people on various issues while other parties find pledges not to do so. And I do think that needs to be said. All right, well, listen, Stephen, thank you very much, Neil, for that. Thank you very much, Neil, and thank you, Natalie. I hope you fed, you fed the seagulls there. Are you whispering to them now? <laughs> are you like Dr. Doolittle or something? The yeah. bird whisperer. <laughs> yeah. Are you whispering to the seagulls, Natalie? Uh, no, I'm squawking, squawking loudly to the seagulls. <laughs> do, do you try to talk to them, do you? No, no, I haven't lost the plot ah, that much yet. Ah, no. ah. Not yet. No, no, I haven't ah. tried. <laughs> that's, that, Natalie, that's not bad. That's kind of coherent. If I was a seagull, I'd kind of be into that. That'd be all right. Oh, Natalie, please. thank you very much indeed. I appreciate okay. you. Thanks. Thanks, Bye. everybody. By the way, lessons learned in the conversation that we've had today. Those lessons are quite clear. Please, and I implore everybody, and I can do this because it's my podcast. I'm not on the radio right now. If I'm on the radio later on tonight, obviously I can't say this to you. 
but I could do it on my own podcast. Don't vote for any of them. Stay clear of the ones that you're familiar with. Stay clear of Fine Gael. Stay clear of Fianna Fáil. Stay clear of Labour parties, if they even exist anymore. Stay clear of Sinn Féin because of the worst opposition party in the history of the state, as far as I'm concerned. Stay clear of the Green Party, because all they do is put taxes on you for no reason whatsoever, based on the hypotheses. Of course, we should all care about the environment. Absolutely. I'm not writing that off. But we should be allowed to have a reasonable de debate around climate change and how it affects us, how it affects the world, and what we should be paying, as far as taxes are concerned, to do that. Green Party are very good at implementing taxes. I, think I call it the stick and carrot approach rather than the carrot and stick approach. There's a whole conversation to be had around electric cars and all that nonsense. But anyway, stay clear of the Green Party. Whatever you do, stay well clear of the sock Dems and people before profit. They are the last people we ever want to see in power in this country. We do not need socialists in power. That's the last thing we want in Ireland. Have a look at a lot of the independent parties that are around. The smaller parties, although some of them have grown very quickly, very fast. Independent Ireland seems to be the biggest one at the moment. Feeling over 70 candidates. Ain't two, I think, of about 50 candidates. And then you've got other parties, like the Irish Freedom Party was mentioned, the National Party, um, Ireland First. There's a couple of other small ones around as well. You can have a look. Just Google them. I'm sure you'll find them. Have a look at their policies. Be very careful, by the way. Have a look at their policies. See what they stand for. Listen to their, their spokespeople or their leaders talking. And make sure they align with your policies. Independent Ireland have already said they don't have the whip um, which if people don't know what the whip is, of course, that means that when, in, when you're in government and you're voting on somebody you are for something, you must vote with the party, whether you agree with it or not. Otherwise, you lose the whip. Well, of course, Independent Ireland says they don't have the whip system. So in other words, candidates are free, you know, to make their own decisions in relation to matters of importance, which I think is a good idea. It, there's pros and cons to it. And I think it's a good idea. Anyway, don't vote for any of the ones that you're normally familiar with. Believe me, they will bring us into another five years of hell. Because Simon Harris came out yesterday um, and they were playing some song in the back. Oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. That was it. You ain't seen nothing yet. Mm -mm. And he came out waving to the crowd. They should have been playing Highway to Hell because that's what's going to happen if you vote for Fianna Gael or Fianna Fáil again. They're going to bring us into another five years of hell. They will not fix all of the things they said they will fix. The only reason they're talking about immigration is because they know there's an election coming up. Please don't have a short memory. Remember, only five, six months ago, of course, you were a right-wing racist if you even suggested what they're suggesting now. If you even suggested putting centres near Dublin Airport to send people home who just shouldn't be here, you would have been called a racist. But it's okay for the government to suggest it if we sign up to a poxy EU migration pact. Remember, the EU migration pact is not a good thing to be signing up to. We're essentially signing up to paying over a lot of money if we don't take asylum seekers or certain asylum seekers. We don't need that. They will sell it to you, saying, well, look, at least we can turn people down now. We can turn them down anyway. We have an immigrate, we have immigration laws in this country. We could be building reception centres near Dublin Airport right now to process people and those who deserve our help get into the country and those that don't should be sent back home. We should be doing that right now. We don't have to wait for an EU migration pact on that. We should have some level of control over our own laws in this country. Yes, we can be part of the EU, if that's what you want for the time being, but we can also have a level of control over our own laws, legislation. The directives come from the EU. That's another thing that's really important, and it's extremely important. Make sure you vote for the right person to go to the EU. Not those who are just enjoying the high time in Brussels and fancy restaurants on a nightly basis on a good salary. You want the ones that are going to come back and report to you what they've done. Look at the EU MEPs who voted for the last time. Where are they? They disappear for four and a half years. They're whining and dining over in Brussels. Then they come back and they start cutting ribbons to supermarkets. All of a sudden, they're visible again just before the election. Why? Because they want you to vote for them again so they can have another five years of the same. And all they did for five years, believe me, is put their hands up to every woke directive they could. That's not what you want in the EU. Now, remember, the EU is important because 75% of our laws and directives come from the EU. So it's important we send the right people over. And this year, there's going to be a turning point to the EU because you're going to see a lot of centrists and right-wing politicians around Europe being voted into the parliament. So it's important we get a balance and we make sure we get those centrists and right-wing people in there too. So make sure you think carefully about who you're sending over. 
Thank you very much to everybody, by the way, who supports the podcast on a regular basis. For those who donate, we really appreciate it. We need your money, by the way. So please donate or subscribe on our website, nileboylan.com. That's nileboylan.com. It's really, really important. We need your help all of the time, not just every now and again. Thank you very much indeed. Now, speaking of immigration, by the way, uh, during the week, I recorded an interview, and I want to put it out to you now because we didn't get a chance to put it out during the week, but it's really important. And it's a very interesting take on immigration and why immigration is financially beneficial for some people. And we spoke to Neil Monroe, who works for Breitbart News, originally Irish, by the way. And we spoke to Neil Monroe, who works for Breitbart News. In an interesting interview, take what you want from it, but I found it very intriguing. Have a listen. Now they're not for open borders. They're not for a free-for-all anymore. They want to bring in immigration rules. They also want to sign up for an EU migration pact, which they say will reduce the amount of people coming into the country because the government will be able to pawn off Europe with 25,000 per person per year just so they don't have to take them and they can return them to the nearest safe, what they call safe country. But that doesn't help people to sort out this whole problem. At the moment, currently, there are too many people coming into the country. Many of them, we don't even know who they are. They tear up the passports on the plane and shove them down the toilet. So we've no idea who they are. They're lying to us, telling us where they're actually from. We do need to help those who genuinely need to be helped. But the others who are economic migrants and chancing their arm are in Ireland. We're giving them accommodation. We're giving them food. We're paying them money. Some of them are staying on tents on the streets. And the thing is, whole thing has turned into a crisis. Now, you would be forgiven to believe that we were the only country in this mess. But we're not. The UK are in a similar mess at the moment. Rishi Sunak is trying to sort that one out. And Joe Biden has created a similar problem in the United States. And when I say Joe Biden has created it, he has created it. It is always reasonably bad on the border of Mexico, of course, and in Texas, particularly El Paso. We've all seen the, the scenes there over the last 10 or 20 years. But it's got considerably worse over the last two or three years. Tell me a little bit more about the crisis in America and how they're dealing with it and what the end result is going to be is Neil Monroe. And uh, Neil is from Breitbart. He's an editor and reporter for Breitbart. Neil, good afternoon to you. Oh, sorry, I didn't hire you up there. That would help. Sorry, Neil. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to you. Uh, Neil, you know, I, I'm looking at your Twitter account. I'm looking at some of the stuff coming out from Breitbart. America is in a similar mess when it comes to immigration. But can we put it all down to Joe Biden? Was it any better when Trump was there? Was it any better when Obama was there before that? Or has it got considerably worse? No. So it's much worse than you think. And the reason I can say that is I've written about 4,500 articles on this subject over the last 15 years. And and every it's it's like a, an onion. You got to keep peeling it back, and you cry more and more as you de as you go further into it. it. It's not just the numbers that are deceptive; it's the arguments. It's the it's from top to bottom, front to back. It's a colossal scam, and it's designed to steer a huge amount of money out of the pockets of ordinary employees into investors and privileged people like that. It's it's an amazing scam. I, I, I saw one of your tweets there. You said migration makes Americans poorer and less productive, but it expands our consumer economy and feeds more taxes to the government. So our uh, decadent leadership insists that it helps us compete against China. Now, of course, Joe Biden has been accused of not only just allowing people to come in, but also assisting them uh, by basically using planes to bring people in, 250,000, I believe, more recently. But how does that improve the American economy in any shape or form uh, for the American government, apart from maybe getting Joe Biden a few votes if they're allowed to vote? And I don't know if they are allowed to vote in the election. No, it is abundantly obvious that uh, migration, inward migration, expands the economy. It doesn't raise productivity. It doesn't raise wages. It doesn't raise living standards. In fact, it makes them all worse but it makes the economy bigger. It's like eating ice cream all day. Of course, you're going to get mm, heavier, but you're not going to get any healthier. And it's also, it's just, the more you look, the worse it gets. So for example, we're bringing in, we've brought in roughly 2 million migrants a year. These are not geniuses who are going to build robots and make Americans more productive. They're not doctors. Many of them, in fact, are just laborers who are, used to fill, uh, to take jobs on the New Jersey Turnpike in the nighttime shift at a 7-Eleven, okay? 
that's great for the owners of the 7-Eleven shops on the New Jersey Turnpike, but it doesn't do anyone any good because it forces down wages. It forces up housing prices. It makes it harder for Americans to have families, to have careers. It makes it harder for Americans to ever say to their employers, uh, sorry, I'm not working here anymore unless you raise my wages. It makes it harder for Americans to say, you need to take some of your profits and buy machines that help us produce more efficient factories. It just makes the country fatter and slower at the same time. But I, when I was in Florida recently, and I, and I go there quite a lot, I go to the United States quite a lot, you know, and I see the guys, you know, cutting the grass in the local housing estates, or I see people fixing roofs or cleaning out pools or whatever it is. It tends to be Mexicans or people that right. have probably crossed the border. And there's an argument, isn't there? And we see it here in this country too with the hospitality industry and the retail sector where, of course, you get the minimum wage paid. That, you know, the Irish wouldn't take those jobs. The American won't take those jobs. Uh, you know, so so we need somebody to do them. No, no, you don't. So the phrase, the Irish wouldn't take those jobs or the Americans wouldn't take those jobs is to implicitly say those jobs are beneath us. Those are the footmen, the coachmen, the scullery maids of our society. We need to import low status people to take those jobs. That's a fundamentally vicious idea because what it means is we don't have to respect these people. And then there's the other point too. When I was a kid, the economic classes would say, okay, we're gonna be clever. We're gonna run an intelligence society. We're gonna use machines. We're gonna educate our people and we're all gonna get richer. And at some point we'll be so rich that People won't want to do these dirty jobs. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to invent machines that can do these jobs. And then we're going to get richer. And then we're going to have so much money, we're going to trade with other countries. So people in Vietnam are poor, but they'll be able to manufacture shoes for us. That way they'll get rich in their home country and we'll have nicer shoes. Eventually they'll be making cars and we'll have nicer cars. Trade was going to make the world richer. And it did. China is phenomenally richer than it now than when I was a kid. Same with much of the Middle East, many other, South America. But the more we pull people out of those countries to take terrible jobs in, in Ireland and in the United States, the slower those countries develop. I mean, what will we do? So instead of developing machines for cleaning roofs or washing windows, we pull people out of Venezuela or Colombia. Well, what that means is in Venezuela now, the young people go north for American jobs and the local dictator doesn't face any rebellious young men. He just exports all the people who don't like his dictatorship. That does nobody any good. We import a subservient class. We don't build machines. Our own people get poorer. Colombia gets poorer. Venezuela gets poorer. The only people who gain are the people who own properties and who have lots of stocks and investments. It's just a terrible policy for the sending countries and the receiving countries. You can see it in Haiti, where in the United States is now trying to restore some sort of quasi-government in Haiti. With one hand, we're talking with various countries here, build a police force, ooh, build an army, try and create a political settlement. And on the other hand, I kid you not, we're, we're, at, we're pulling 9,000 people out of Haiti every month. Anyone who has any ambition to be a doctor, to be an accountant, to be a businessman, to be a policeman, a security guard, we're pulling them into the United States for low wage jobs instead of letting them build up Haiti. It's I, I, I know Donald Trump mentioned something similar recently when he was talking about, obviously, the electric cars being built in Mexico and he was going to stop them coming in or put certainly a huge levy on them coming into the United States to, to build up the car business in the United States, which has been decimated. Yeah. But Joe Biden seems to have been checkered throughout his uh, three-year tenure so far uh, with more or less assisting uh, immigrants. And you say this is, of course, to build up the economy of America, to make it look good. Um, but realistically, as you say yourself, it's taking the money out of Americans' pockets. But the big thing that Trump goes on about is he uses this word criminals, people from lunatic asylums, as he says. You know, are there any checks and balances? Are you in a similar situation to the way we are here in Ireland, where people are arriving at our ports with no documentation, no passports, they've dumped it down the toilet of a plane somewhere. Uh, are they? Is it similar in the United States where they're literally just walking through the border? Yes, 
anyone can walk. We've had 150,000 Chinese walk through the border. We have no idea who they are. And, and under a curious feature of American law, if someone walks through the country illegally and they commit a crime and we jail them, say, five years, at the end of the five years, we have to ask the foreign government to take their criminal back home. Well, gosh, they're not going to do so. So we will then be stuck with criminals living inside the United States. But it's really important. The dramatic scenes we see at the border are not the important things. In England, the boat people, it's not the important thing. The, in Ireland, guys dropping off their identity at the airport is not the important thing. What's important is the sheer volume of people coming in under various illegal, quasi-legal and legal measures, because that's what drives up housing prices. That's what drives down wages. That's what reduces investment and productivity. We see it in Canada. It's, there's so many immigrants being pulled into Canada by that nice young man, Mr. Trudeau. <laughs> and Canadians can't get married because they can't afford houses. So the birth rate is going down. And when the birth rate goes down, you know what happens? The business guys rub their chins and say, gosh, we need more immigrants. And so the same thing has happened in the United States. But, United is, States but isn't that what's happening worldwide? And that's why we're seeing this happening. For example, in Ireland, you know, the birth replacement rate is 2.4. Uh, at the moment, we're only or 2.1. Sorry, at the moment, we're only at 1.7. So we're below birth replacement rate. And I suppose the government thinking on this is, well, we can't allow the population to get older. We'll have no pensions. We won't be able to pay the pensions in 20 years time. Neil, I'm going to have to stop for a second. The, there's there's something on your computer that's making noise. Is it emails coming in or something like that? But it just keeps going. But bling. I don't know. I'm not too sure what it is. I, I just... have no. I've yes, I know what it is. It's um, I know it. I know what that is. Hang on. It's, it's happened. I, it happened twice or three times there, but I just kind of ignored it. It wasn't too bad. But it just keeps no, doing no, it. I'm going to fix this by doing a force quit. Okay. Um, and um, which they don't. If you want the pop, the birth rate to go back up, you got to allow people to get decent jobs, decent homes, decent circumstances, so people want to have more kids. But our governments don't care about that. The business guys and the investors don't care about that. From their point of view, the more immigrants, the better. Because there's a, a parallel problem here. Business wants more consumers, they want more renters. They want more workers. That's rational. It makes complete sense. Government wants more poor people because poor people uh, provide customers for government agencies. They create problems, which means politicians can do important things solving the problems they create. And in general, government and business want societies to be chaotic, diverse, constantly changing, so that the public does not argue about wages and housing. They want the public to argue about preposterous things like immigration or even more preposterous things, transgenderism. They want people to be divided because it's easier to rule them. And so on the question of population, the answer is entirely clear. Men and women want to have babies. Just help them have babies by decent jobs, decent wages, decent homes. You you mentioned transgenderism, of course, that was big in the news over the last week was Transgender Day of Visibility, which happened to fall on the same day as Easter Sunday, which Joe Biden uh, obviously was questioned in relation to, I saw his press secretary uh, trying to come up with some silly answers as to why it was allowed to, or why the focus seemed to be more on the Transgender Day of Visibility rather than Easter Sunday. Now, of course, Donald Trump was straight out of the trap and he said, we're now going to have National Christian Day of Visibility on the 5th of November, which is the day he hopes to get elected. Um, did that cause a huge problem in the United States? Um, so I, I follow the transgenderism issue very closely here. And it's, it's, in a way, it's very similar to immigration because what the government is doing here is destroying the border between men and women, between sexual normal people and minorities. And they're doing that because it creates more diversity and more chaos. And when you do more diversity and chaos, government officials can feel good about putting out the fires they started last night. Transgenderism is completely incoherent 
completely insane, completely destructive. Then you, should, you try to say that to a tra- person who's transgender, they'll tell you, I feel perfectly fine. I just identify as a different gender. Yes, no problem. There's a, there's basically, there's two sexes and a million characters. If there's no such thing as gender. If a person wants to dress in women's clothes, fine, no problem. If a person, uh, if some teenager says, oh, I feel like a teenage boy, says, oh, I feel like a woman, fine, no problem. The, the chief problem comes when the government says, you know, we need, we want to help this 1% of people by changing the rules for everybody else. That's insane. Well, Can- no well, well you, you mentioned Trudeau a while ago. Canada's gone right down that rabbit hole, really, haven't yeah. they? I mean, you couldn't go further down the rabbit hole than Canada's gone. Uh, yeah, <laughs> don't say that. They'll find new ways. So in, in the whole transgender issue, there's good manners and decency and respect for the privacy and the private and the autonomous life of everybody. But society, rely, we are male and we are, are female. Male and female are different. They're equal and they're complementary. And laws and customs and norms need to recognize this. That's why women have their own sports leagues, for example. And for government to come in and just wreck these rules in the supposed interest of a tiny minority is civic vandalism. It's like the government... That's virtue signaling, isn't it? it, It's worse than that. Virtue signaling implies it's sort of, in a way, harmless. This is vandalism they are wrecking rules that have supported humans for thousands of years a simple matter here teenagers go through a lot of turmoil in their teenage years it can be really brutal especially now because of the cell phones where kids are measuring each other's status by the hour it's really brutal and yet the government by endorsing all this transgenderism lunacy is making it more difficult for kids to get through the teenage years. Now they're being, instead of saying, look, stick to your studies, uh, uh, try to ignore porn, you'll be an adult, it gets better down the in a few years. The government's saying, oh, we can solve your problem. Here's a knife, here's a drug. It's, it's really ruthless, it's vindictive, it's destructive, it's scientifically insane. I'm not sure I've been quite clear enough. I think you've been clear on that. In relation to, to where they're going in the United States, um, you know, uh, to say puberty blockers, you mentioned, of course, medication there a second ago, puberty blockers. What is generally the, the gist of it when it comes to the states in the United States? Are puberty blockers banned in any states or are they prescribed to teenagers in many states? In some states, they're curbing them. But uh, the federal government is going in a different direction. It's planning, for example, now to make it economically impossible for schools, K through 12 schools, to uh, have boys and girls play in separate um, school uh, sports leagues. It's constantly bombarding children with claims that their personality is slippery. And maybe if you're a girl worried about your appearance, you really want to be a boy. There are many school systems run secret uh, programs to promote transgenderism without the parents. So, you know, it's... A, but, but can you can that be changed? I mean, Donald Trump has promised to change that within yeah. his first 48 hours yeah. of office, yeah. that he said he would defund any school that promotes this idea. Yeah. But, can, but here's the thing, he can say what he wants. Can he do that? Uh, um, no, this, he cannot do it without Congress, but the president has enormous influence to push it one way or the other. And uh, it is President Obama who pushed this rock down the hill several years ago. So like in trend, trend in this issue, like in immigration, you have, to, you have to be good and decent towards the people who claim they're transgender and towards the migrants. And sometimes they're correct. And sometimes you're, they're entitled to make their own mistakes. But what are... But the way the money flows in this country and over there, it rewards governments to expand these ideas, to expand migration. And basically, in the end, to help these minorities, which there's some obligation to do, they're imposing huge damage on ordinary people, Irish, Canadians, New Zealanders, Australians, you name it. And so for people to understand this, they need to understand what are the incentives on government, on business. If I if I have a, th- a company of a thousand people, I can make roughly 
30 million dollars on the stock market by cutting wages of one dollar per hour for every employee so there's just vast amount of money and the government has to lean in and say we're going to protect ordinary people from this and by the way ordinary people is not just blue collars in the united states we have a massive problem where um migrants immigrants quasi-immigrants in the form of temporary visa workers they engage in all sorts of really vicious office politics where in fact they more or less fire americans quietly some hr person some lower level manager will fire an american engineer so he can sell the job to a co-ethnic uh, via back channels and you're going to have the same thing you have more Indians coming into Ireland. For the do white you still do you stop. still guess? I mean, I know America, one of the first countries to kind of experiment with what they called at the time affirmative action. Um, is that still the case in the United States? Are they still oh, doing that yeah, affirmative yeah. action? No, affirmative action. Now, there's it's a common thing. You have one set of laws written on the books, and out of those laws spring a vast. Uh, encyclopedias of laws and rules and practices at individual companies. And then from those rules, you get huge amounts of people arbitraging those rules for their private advantage. And uh, this is mixed in with the money, mixed in with other ambitions. And you get to situations where a huge percentage of American technology jobs are now held by Indians working for Indian managers. So much so that the many top jobs in the American tech sector are now run by Indians who prefer to hire Indians, who prefer to invest and create new jobs in India. This creates massive problems for the white collar sector, for innovation, productivity, for white collar prosperity and kids. I cover these. I'm surprised. I'm surprised they get away with that because I imagine most of the tech jobs are in California, and I'm sure most Americans would like to cut California off and sail it out to the sea somewhere. But I, I, I'm surprised that they get away with not, you know, hiring, you know, a diverse workforce in places like California because California is probably the wokest part of the world, isn't it? That's why they get away with it. A huge factor in this is journalism. Ordinary journalists do not have the power. They don't have the power even if they want to, to reach up to their editors and say, mm -hmm. I'm going to write this. Because the editor is thinking, well, you know, I don't know what those guys further up the chain want. And so you get situations where there's a top editor of the New York Times who basically argues, we must have immigration from Asia to, to ensure that America never becomes a European-oriented society again. That's at the New York Times. So it's over here, Journalists are more or less powerless. They, they, can, they write heart-rending stories about individual migrants and happy stories about some migrants who gets a job, but they can't follow the money. They can't follow the money, even when the administration officials will stand up in public and say on video, this is all about money. They can't follow it. There's very few people who can follow the money. I can follow the money. I love following the money. I've found a huge amount of money. I understand how the immigration system works by following the money. Uh, basically, immigration allows you to slip a huge amount of money out of wages into stocks and bonds, and it's privately well, distributed well, to shareholders. Well, immigration That's is quite uh, fruitful uh, over here for people who own hotels, uh, who own catering oh. companies, who own accommodation. <laughs> Um, there is millions, millions, actually billions being paid, even though we're such a small country of 5 million people, there is now billions uh, being paid every year uh, to accommodate, feed, clothe, educate, uh, healthcare. Even we actually spent 820,000, I think it was, recently on bringing Ukrainians' dogs into Ireland right. and to okay, keep them so in no, kennels. So now you bring, you spend 820,000 on bringing dogs in. Okay, that's great for the airlines. It's great for the specialized companies that transport dogs. It's great for the kennel guys. It's great for the for the uh, additional worker working minimum wage at the kennel. But most of all, it's great for companies that invest in these things. So if you look at whole real estate, okay, we have the same problem here. More or less as a sort of standard rule, if you increase the flow of immigrants into one area by 1%, the price of real estate rises by 1%. 
But if you do it rapidly and suddenly, then, for example, you can get a 1% increase in population, causing an 8% increase in property prices. The amount of money that can be made out of immigration via property is just colossal. In some ways, immigration is a real estate Ponzi scheme. And that way, money is transferred. But the, but, the problem, yeah, but the problem is, Neil, we don't have the real estate. The problem is that we have already had a currently, we had a housing crisis before this really kicked off. Now, don't get me wrong, we've had, you know, thousands of people coming to Ireland over the last 20 years. But over the last three or four years, particularly, those numbers have grown exponentially uh, to people seeking international protection and also 120,000 Ukrainians, which doesn't seem like a lot of people. But for a country with a population of five million people that was already in a housing crisis with not enough houses, supply and demand, et cetera, et cetera, that was a huge problem for us. So the majority of these people are staying in either people's houses and 800 uh, euro was being given to families to house a, a refugee, for example. Um, and it's also being given to hotels. So we've got 40% of the accommodation ho in hotels in Ireland currently at the moment is taken up with refugees, which is damaging to our tourist in tourism in industry as well. You, you, you use the word problem. It's not a problem. If there's a shortage of housing and you bring in another couple of hundred thousand people, the price of housing will spike upwards. Oh, it has. It's not problem it's an advantage it's a gain if you're a landlord every single migrant that can't fit in the country is a more money it's just you keep it's not you have to understand well, it's a, it, it, may, but yeah, it may be a financial gain for investors but it's not a social gain for a country is it yeah, yes that's very nice of you but what drives this is the money it's the investors and if there is a profit to be made, a billion dollars, for example, by stuffing in another 100,000 migrants, they're going to do it. That's the point. Immigration is not done for the benefit of the receiving society, despite all the rah, rah, rah about diversity and restaurants. No, it is done for the benefit of people who make money by moving people around. The more crowded it is, the higher the rents. The more crowded it is, the higher the food prices. The more crowded it is, the lower the wages. The worse it is, the better it is. Well, look, that it's been a very it's a very interesting conversation. I, I don't know where we're all going to go from here, between here, the United Kingdom, other countries in Europe, and, of course, America. Well, of course, Donald Trump said he'll sort it all out if he gets elected on November the 5th. Uh, that he is going to have mass deportations again. I, you know, it's all well and good to him to say that. Can he do that even? Um, no and yes. Migrants are rational. Most of them are decent. They're, a huge number are coming up north because they have poor kids in their home countries. And you and I would do it too. Yep. But if we change the incentives here so that wages go up, migrants go home, and then... The capital, all the money that the investors have, they're not going to leave it sitting around in a bank. They're going to find a place to invest it. And it's going to go into places like robots and productivity to help Americans do more work and investments in the countries. So Venezuela, it has huge oil industries. It can have other industries. If the Venezuelans can't come up here, we'll send the money down to Venezuela to help them build a better life. But well, well, that, isn't that what they're trying to do in Europe at the moment with the EU migration pact, which a lot of people don't want us no, to sign no, up to? No, 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 no. But they, they, they want to invest money in the countries where people are coming from, be it Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, or whatever it happens to be. Stop. It's just a lie. When they talk about investing money in, say, some African country, let's say the Congo, what they're talking about is tiny amounts of money in exchange for pulling out the young people from those countries. So if you're actually growing up in country like Ivory Coast and the European governments are telling you, come north, come north, come live in Paris, come live in London, come live in Amsterdam, and, and we'll send a million dollars back down to Ivory Coast to create new jobs at a 7-Eleven uh, store. What do you think the result is? People go north. How can you invest in a country when the young people are going north? This is what happened in Ireland for a hundred years. People expected to leave. They did leave. 
and therefore nobody would set up factories or jobs in Ireland because everybody was expecting the young people to leave. This is part of the scam about migration. They say, oh, we're going to invest in these countries. No, no, no. We will invest far more in those countries if we can't extract their young people for jobs here. We will invest in those countries because we won't have the young, we won't have surplus labor. It will be what we want to make sure the policy says it is in the interest of investors to invest in uh, Irish, to invest in Irish technology, to invest in Irish homes, to make life better for Irish people, but also to make life better for the developing countries. So if you look at a fairly simple examples, El Salvador, we extracted their young people for decades. We left behind a wrecked country where crime was massive and high. Now, for the uh, people of El Salvador elected a guy who has adopted very tough measures and has reduced crime. So what's going to happen next? Investors are going to say, you know, we can invest in El Salvador. The crime rate is low. There's plenty of labor there. There's peace and quiet. Immigration wrecks poor countries. We pull out the young people from poor countries and we leave behind half empty towns with no hope of investment. It's deeply selfish and destructive, not only here, but there. It, and it used to be in the industrial economy, you know, you have this memory of Irish people coming to America in the 1800s. This was an empty America where there was literally empty land. There was free land. There was land that was not being used in any way of, so they could fill it up with population. We were suddenly inventing all sorts of new factories and, um, uh, and we, needed people, we needed people to fill those factories. We're not doing that now. We don't need more migrants. Some migrants are good. Many migrants are good. Some are useful. Too many is bad. Um, and in the case of Ireland, the more immigrants you bring in, the lower the wages, the higher the housing prices, fewer families, fewer kids, fewer machines, lower productivity, and then you'll have more demand for more immigration. It's a vicious, vicious circle. circle. It seems to be. It's been an interesting conversation. People can make what they want of it. It's been a very interesting conversation. I thank you for joining us, Neil Monroe, editor and reporter with Breitbart News. Thank you for joining us today. The multi-award winning Niall Boylan podcast. Listen live on Facebook, YouTube, and all the usual live stream services. To get in touch, just WhatsApp or text 085 100 2255. The Niall Boylan podcast. They told me to shut up. Available for download from all your usual platforms.